Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm at the University of Ottawa with the Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. And this is a continuation of a, a series of videos on our climate change emergency and what we have to do to deal with it. So the Arctic sea ice is undergoing a death spiral right now. So September is the black. And then the two, the two lines here, the blue and the purple, are the months bracketing September. And then if you go out another two months on either side, you get these uh, here and so on. So what's happening is the ice is spiraling to zero very, very rapidly. And in the very near future, matter of years, where I'm expecting to see the first blue ocean event where there's no sea ice, where the black line goes through zero. So why is the ice suffering so much right now in October and November? And this is the main reason. We're seeing Greenland's up here. This is the Atlantic side here, and this is the Bering Strait, and Alaska is over here. So we're seeing the ice being attacked on both sides here by very, very warm air coming in. So if you take the average temperature anomaly relative to the long-term climatological mean, these, these temperatures up here are seven, eight degrees. Anything orange and above is six degrees warmer than normal for the entire month over these regions. So just imagine the melt that's going on in, in Greenland here, which is raising sea level. And imagine what the, it's happening to the ice as it's circulating through the basin through these warm areas. It's just not able to grow in its normal positions because it's just being cut off by this very warm water. And since the ocean is open, there's very strong wave action, which is also uh, mixing up the very thin ice, ensuring that it can't expand to its usual levels. This is the air temperature anomaly in October. Um, over So what we have here is, this is the surface down here, a thousand millibar. So we get very warm, above six degree temperatures. And then we go to the orange, which is five and above. And this is going up. So this is about a kilometer in the atmosphere. For every hundred you drop here, you go up another uh, kilometer. So this is a kilometer high, two kilometer high, three kilometer. This is about 5.5 kilometers high and so on. So we get to the top of the troposphere, which is very low at the Arctic, it's about seven kilometers here. But the, so the entire troposphere is showing warming here in you know the whole northern region. This is 66 north to 90 north. So this is the North Pole. So you can see how the atmosphere is completely warming because the, there's a lot of uh, heating on the surface and it's propagating up into the atmosphere. So there's loads of daily information on Arctic sea ice. So I've shown previously the sea ice thickness here. The only thick ice is pushed up against the Canadian archipelago. This is much different from just a few days ago. So what we see here, the motion of the, of the, of the air circulation is pulling, pushing the ice around, so this is the motion, the arrows are going this way, so the ice is cycling this way. So this ice, and uh, it's at the maximum speeds, this is 30 centimeters per second drift of the sea ice, and we're seeing how it's being driven, the ice, the thick ice that's along the Canadian archipelago is being driven out into the Atlantic Ocean where it's destroyed by the warm water temperatures. So this is why the sea ice volume has stalled. It's not growing. We're getting huge export here. We've got the warm water coming in both sides. And uh, I show some data here. So, so this is again the ice thickness here. This is the sea surface temperature. So, you know, it's all above zero here, basically. Um, and so, so, base, so water freezes, seawater freezes at minus 1.8. That's if it's um, 35. Uh, PSU salinity. So you can see there two to four degrees is the blue. You can see the warm water impinging here and the water here is imp so the, the ice is being surrounded by warm water which is which is really restricting the expansion of the extent and area this year. 
And in fact, it declined in the last few days, the extent, which we haven't seen. You know, this is November. It should be like forming. This is sea surface salinity. So you can see, um, you know, there, the, when there's a lot of melt, there's a lot of fresh water. And there's an awful lot of fresh water on the edges. So this sea ice, as it's trying to expand, it's hitting the warmer water on the surface. It's melting. That creates fresher water and a lower salinity on the edges. And there's also wave action. So if there's three meter waves, um, then that's propagating downwards and affecting the mixing down to um, much, much deeper levels. And the water is warmer underneath. So that warm water is coming up from the mixing, replacing the water that has melted the previous ice. So this will keep going until the water cools down through the water column. This is sea surface height. Um, colder water is denser. That will be a lower sea surface height. Warmer water expands, it's higher. So this is sea surface height difference. So the red here is plus 60 centimeters, 0.6 meters, about two feet. The purple here is about minus a meter or minus three feet. So in other words, the surface of the ocean, where the water is coming in from the Bering Strait, from the Pacific, is two feet higher than, it's actually two, plus two feet, this is minus three feet. So the difference from here to here is about five feet. So the water, of course, flows downhill. The water, that brings in more warm water from the Pacific flowing through into the Arctic region, you know, underneath the ice that's there and it, the, so the ice is it's being attacked from above by the very warm air temperatures. It's being attacked from below by the very warm water temperatures. And it's being attacked on all sides by wave action and very warm water. So if this trend continues of sea ice loss, there's a high probability that the first blue ocean event will occur, I think, 2020 I, rather than 2022. This ice-free duration would be less than a month in September, and then it extends to three months. Um, so August, September, October, ice-free by say 2021 or 22. Five months, no Arctic Ocean sea ice. So July, August, September, October, November by about 2023. And all year, gone all year by 2030. This is what I expect with these enormous feedbacks. One of the main feedbacks to get rid of the ice is the albedo. But once the ice is gone, and as it's going, it's a latent heat feedback. So it takes a lot of energy to melt ice. And when you melt the ice, you end up with water at zero Celsius. So the water, the temperature doesn't change that much. Get rid of the ice and the temperature will skyrocket because to melt one kilogram of ice, uh, you need a lot of energy. Apply that same energy to one kilogram of water at zero Celsius, just above freezing point, and that water will rise to 80, raise up to 80 Celsius. So we won't see 80 Celsius water on the surface of the Arctic because it mixes and it'll warm the water down below. But it just gives you an idea of the huge feedbacks. I mean, the warming in the Arctic is going to skyrocket when we lose that sea ice. The snow cover, as everybody talks about sea ice, but the, the exponential decline in the sea ice, but the Arctic spring snow cover is declining twice as fast as the sea ice. And you can see here, this is a deficit of snow in the Arctic Northern Hemisphere in the spring, in June. This is contributing just as much, this is decreasing the albedo or making the Arctic darker at an even faster rate than the sea ice is doing, you know, for, for, for the spring months. So Greenland's up there. The, the melt of Greenland is gonna greatly accelerate. We've actually seen melt over almost the entire surface of Greenland already. This is gonna become more and more common. Um, and the albedo of Greenland is dropping because of surface meltwater ponds. Um, as the ice melts back, it uncovers and concentrates dirt on the surface. And we also get tremendous amounts of ash being delivered to the Arctic from northern boreal forest fires. So massive fires in Siberia and northern Canada. Um, the ones in Siberia specifically are, are not, a lot of them are just left to burn. And that ash is going up into the Arctic by this very wavy jet stream, which is carrying not just warm air, but also ash. 
So it's accelerating to the, to the loss of ice. So we have all these cascading feedbacks in play. Worldwide disasters are rising due to climate change. We've got hydrological, we've got more storms, we've got um, heat waves and things. Those are all adding up and increasing. And also you can make a case that um, geophysical events will also increase under rapid climate change. So you know, sea level is a huge, gonna have a huge impact on humanity. It's most of the sea level rise is from expansion of water, more glacial melt and ice cap melting. Present rate, 3.4 millimeters a year. Projected rise about a foot by 2050, up to two meters or over six feet by 2100. I think these are all underestimates. We, I expect maybe seven meters by 2070 if these rates, exponential rates of Greenland and Antarctic ice mass continue. In the 121,000 years ago, um, in the last warm period, the sea did rise two inches per year for over 50 years. That's five centimeters per year. So the system is capable of having very, very rapid sea level rise. The oceans are str stratifying and becoming more acidic. The acidity has increased about 30% in, in the last three or four decades. And this is going to severely impact the base of the marine food chain. So um, there's albedo flipping in the Arctic. Um, right now, the sea ice forcing gives about 0.1 watts per squ meter squared if you average over the Earth, and that will increase to 0.3 times when the sea ice is gone for the first month, um, for blue, first blue ocean event, say by 2020. And when the sea ice is gone year round, it's seven times the forcing right now. So this is the rate of warming in the Arctic is now about two degrees Celsius per decade, six times the global rate. That will increase as the ice vanishes due to all these cascading feedbacks. There's huge amounts of methane in the Arctic. So 1,700 gigatons in, on land, 1,750 in, under the sea in the eastern Siberian Arctic shelf permafrost. 50 is in precarious state in the very top layers. It's liable to have a sudden release. We've had five gigatons in the atmosphere today. So even if 15 gigatons went in over 10 years, that would dominate CO2 forcing, leaving absolutely no chance for zero, two degrees Celsius stabilization, let alone 1.5. So despite our efforts, they're too little, too late. We have to step them up um, correspondingly. So, you know, if, this, if, this, if we had this release of the 50 gigatons, Levels of the methane in the atmosphere would go up 11 times, catastrophic feedback loop, warming would spiral up, world food production would spiral down, geopolitical unrest and countries collapsing would, would uh, make it a very nasty place on our planet. And this shows where the Eastern Siberian Arctic Shelf is right across from Greenland here. So the methane levels globally have been, are rising, they, they stabilized off here, but they started rising rapidly in 2007. There's an awful lot of fracking and leakage rates, but there's also more coming from the Arctic now. So the methane from the seafloor in the Arctic, up to now it's been quite small, 10 to 20 megatons. Over the last five years, there's been a rapid escalation. The region to watch, again, the Eastern Siberian Arctic Shelf, one of the largest, Arctic, one of the largest continental shelves on the planet, um, there used to be ice over there. Now it's very much open for long periods of the year. So the water's warmer. We're getting these plumes tens of meters in diameter a few years back. And then within a year or two after that, <coughs> remeasured <coughs> hundreds of plumes as large as a kilometer in diameter. The area ratio is 2,500 times larger. That would be the methane coming out ratio as well. So this is where the methane is. We have it in cloth rate. We have it in the permafrost. As the water is warming, it perforates the permafrost. We get methane going up through the water column. We're measuring higher levels of methane in Barrow, Alaska, also in Svalbard. So the methane is being detected to, to rise at, at surface levels across the Arctic. This is where the methane is. Um, the, uh, this is the uh, International Permafrost Association. So we have Continuous methane is the dark purple going to discontinuous, sporadic, and isolated. So it surrounds the Arctic region. We're warming this region like crazy. Of course, there's going to be this 